T tonight, God has put it in our in my heart to talk to us about removing limitations that we have placed on God. Now we are simply asking the question: Can people limit God? You know, there have been notions in African Christianity, or even in some circles, that what if if that is God's will for you, it will come to you. That is not true. There are a lot of God's wills that never happen. It is God's will that people live righteously. They, they don't do that. It is God's will that people give their lives to Him, that none should perish. But people will perish. And a lot of them will not give their lives to Him. So, just because something is God's will doesn't mean it will happen automatically. So, people can limit what God can do with them. Some people will say, well, if it is yours, it will come to you. If it is not yours, then it will go. No. Even after God has given you eternal life, after you have given your life to Christ, and you've been given eternal life, God says to you, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. This is the exhortation Paul gave to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Now, Timothy was the bishop of the church at Ephesus. So God, Paul was not addressing an unbeliever. He was addressing someone that already possesses eternal life. But he said, you have to lay hold on it. You have to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on it. So that saying that if it is yours, it will come to you is not true. You've got to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on the things God has given to you. Or else you can end up limit, limiting God in your life. You can limit God's power available for your healing. You can limit God's provision to you. You can limit God in various ways. And tonight we want to spend it to learn how that might happen and how we can remove the limitations that we may have placed on God. You know, it's good to think in this manner. It's good to, to, to come to a conclusion that God, you are not the one waiting for God. In the issues that concerns you, you are not the one waiting for God. God is the one waiting for you. God is waiting for you to allow Him to do what He wants to do. People say, well, how can that be? Well, are you the one that moved God to send Jesus to die on a cross for you? God had loved you even before you came to the knowledge of God. God has loved humanity and sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Jesus took our sins upon himself and gave us his own righteousness. We didn't coerce him to do that. We did not beg him to do that. We did not motivate him to do that. Salvation which encompasses both our healing, our provisions, and our eternal destiny with him, they were all thought of by God, executed by God without our input. And then the good news of what God has done is given to us in the gospel. That when we respond by faith, believing the gospel, then we experience it in our lives. So, so, so it is God that is waiting for us. So let's look at what are certain limitations that we may have placed on God so that we can remove them, so that our lives can run swiftly with God, we can walk with God and experience all the good things that God has for us. He said, my thoughts concerning you is not out of evil. We don't need to persuade God to change his mind to do you good. 
the very thought of God towards you is that of good and not evil. Jesus said, he said, in that day you will ask the Father. He said, I'm not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf. Why? Because the Father himself loves you. It was love that made him send Jesus. It was love that made him arrange the salvation plan with all its contents. And that love doesn't need any persuasion from man for it to stay. But man needs to respond to it by faith to enjoy it. Praise the Lord. So can people limit God? The answer is yes. Let's look at Psalm 78 verse 41. Psalm 78 verse 41 the Bible says yes again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel so you've just seen it in the scripture the Bible says the children of Israel in the wilderness they tempted God again and again and they limited him. They limited the Holy One of Israel. God is not limited in his power in any way. He is omnipotent. There is nothing too difficult for him. But people can limit their experience of God in their lives. They can limit that power of God in the way it operates in them. Now concerning before we go into the specific account that the scripture has just given concerning the children of Israel, let me show you from other parts of scripture how people have limited God in time past. Uh, in, in Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Mark gospel, chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. This is what the Bible says about how people limited the power of God in their midst. I read Mark chapter 6 verse 5. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Now, this is Jesus, in whom dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And the Spirit of God was not given to him by measure. This is Jesus available in Nazareth. And the Bible says he could do no mighty works there. Not that he chose not to do. Not that Jesus chose not to do mighty works. The Bible used the word could not. Could do no mighty works. He couldn't do mighty works there. Not because his power was limited. But because the people limited the ability to receive. The Bible said it was through unbelief. Their unbelief limited them. Now, this was not through their disbelief. It's not that they refused completely to believe in Jesus. Or why, why did they come to hear him if they were completely disbelieving? If they were completely disbelieving. But though they had some belief in him, but they had questions that truncate that belief, hindered them to flow in order to receive from him. They had wrong things I've believed before that, that kept them from being able to go all out by faith and receive what God was offering through Jesus. And it is this wrong belief system that existed in them as unbelief. And see how Jesus decided to solve the problem. The Bible says, because of that, he went about the villages in a circuit, teaching. Teaching is a way by which you change people's 
belief system to align with the love of God, to align with reality in the spirits so that they can receive. So when Jesus marveled at their unbelief, marveled at the wrong things they believe about God and about their walk with God, their interaction with God, when Jesus marveled about that, he decided to have mercy on them. He decided to help them. So he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. And so those people limited God not because God was unwilling, but because they could not receive from him because of unbelief. Now, another place you can see that kind of thing is in uh, Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 and 38. Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 38. I'll just read that place for us. Jesus was in Jerusalem and he cried out to them. And this is what he said, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you, wouldn't, you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. So here again, Jesus expressed his willingness, how he wanted to save them. He wanted to gather the children of Jerusalem as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What, what does, how does the hen gather her chicks under her wings? Is to save them, cover them, and hide them from the predator, from hawks and eagles. And that's what Jesus wanted to do because the enemy was all out against Jerusalem and he wanted to gather them under his wings, but they wouldn't let him. They were not willing. They limited his ability, his power in their lives. God's power never diminishes. God's power was there, was all as powerful, all powerful as before. But since God would not overrule man's willingness to help the man, man has to will to cooperate with God. Since God would not overrule, overrule man's will, then Jerusalem suffered. God left them to themselves and they suffered. Of course, you know that in AD 70, Jerusalem was so destroyed. The children of Israel were dispersed to all the kingdoms of the world. In fact, history book has it that the slave, slave price crashed because when, when the Roman general Titus marched on Jerusalem and massacred thousands upon thousands of them and millions of them, and captured many others, many others alive and sold them in the slave market. The prices of slaves crashed. So the children of Israel stayed in foreign land until 1948 when they came back to establish Israel as a country again. So that's another example. But in, in the context in which we are now talking about, in Psalm 78, verse 41, the Bible says, Again and again, they tempted God. They limited the Holy One of Israel. How did the children of Israel in the wilderness limit God? I will just give you three points. There are many more, but because of time, I'll give you three points how they limited God. Number one, they limited Him by abdicating from battle, though they were armed for success. So the Bible says in that Psalm 78, verses 8 to 10, the Bible says, And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its hearts aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. Let's stop there. So we see the children of Ephraim. The Bible 
in this passage, God won the remainders of, 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 of the children of Israel, their, their children, you know, the generations that came after them. God warned them, don't be like your fathers. He said their heart was not faithful to God. They were a stubborn and rebellious generation. And what made them stubborn and rebellious? Though God has given them everything they needed to fight. And asked them, go and fight. Fight in Jericho. Fight. And take the land. The Bible says, though they were armed with bow and arrow, they were armed with everything that they needed for success. They refused to engage the battle. They turned back. They turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of the law. And, and, and God considered them rebellious and stubborn. Brethren, do you know that you also, you have been armed? The Bible in, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, talks about how God disarmed the powers of darkness. So he disarmed principalities and powers and made a shoe of them openly. But that same God turned around and armed you. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he said, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by enemies harm you. So God, who disarmed principalities and powers, turned around to arm you and said, look, begin to trade on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. But do you know that there are Christians, even though they have been armed in that way, they still don't make use of the power. They still don't trample on, 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 on the powers of darkness. They, 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 they don't know how to re rebuke the enemy. They, instead they cry, hey, why won't God do this for me? Instead of turning around and saying, you that devil, that you are trying to cause this in my life, I come against you in the name of Jesus. I command you to let your hands off that thing. They will not take the authority. And they turn to God. It's not God's responsibility to cast out the devil. You have been given the power to trample on him. And you have to use it. When you don't use it, you are neglecting your salvation. You are neglecting what you've been given. You are, you, are, you are operating with unbelief. You are not believing God when God says he has armed you with power. You are not believing him. And God wants you to believe him. To disbelieve God is a serious crime. How can God, who paid such a price for us, how can we think that he was joking with us. How can we take his words as if he's not true? How can Jesus leave heaven and come and suffer such a cruel death on the cross for us? How can he tell us that he has given us power and authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy? And we say, ah, let us be careful about this so we cannot be too sure. How can we disbelieve him? How can we make him out to be a liar? Well, that's how people limit God in their lives. Because they don't take the word of God seriously. They don't act on it. Do you know in Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. Do you know that if you don't bind on earth, it will not be bound from heaven? And I like the way New Living Translation put it. He said, whatever you allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. Whatever you disallow on earth will be disallowed in heaven. It is time to look at illegal things happening around about you and say to those the powers behind the illegal things, I disallow you, and stay on it without wavering. And then you will have it. You will have it. But without taking your authority like that, you limit God, because the power of God walks through you. The authority of God walks through you to execute God's vengeance 
against your enemies. Praise the Lord. So the children of Israel abdicated from battle, though they were armed for success. Do you know that God does not like that to happen? God wants you to take your place. God wants you to use the authority He has given to you. Start speaking to your mountains. Start speaking to the devils that come against you and cast them out. It is not difficult. If you believe it, when you say it, it happens. Whether you see it or not, whether you feel it or not, it happens. They have been cast out. You have to get used to believing that when you speak, it has taken place. If you don't believe it, how can the devil that you're speaking to believe it? Praise the Lord. Then the second thing that the children of Israel in that passage did that limited the power of God in their lives is that they consider some things too much for God to do. They consider some things too too big for God to do. You know, there are some people who are comfortable about small, small things. If they hear that God is doing some small, small things, ah, they say, yes, that must be God. When they hear of some big things, they say, no, those people that are using jazz, they are using juju, they are very skeptical about the dramatic, about very big things. And they doubt it. Can it really be true? Well, they are not the first want to do that. The children of Israel did that. In Psalm 78 verses 18 to 22. That's Psalm 78 verse, verse, from verse 18 to 22 I read. And they tested God in their hearts by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God Prepare a table in the wilderness. Behold, he struck the rock so that the water gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Verse 21. Therefore, the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. You see, these people, <laughs> the Bible said that they tasted God in their hearts by asking for the food of their fancy. They were not asking for the food that they needed. They, they, they asked for the one of their fancy because they wanted to prove that God is not able to do those kind of lofty things. So they moved away from their need to ask for what they fancy. And the Bible said they spoke against God, say, can he prepare a table in the wilderness? Yes, we know he struck the rock and water has gushed out and stream overflowed. But can he give bread also? Can he give meat in the wilderness? You know, considering that to be too much for God to do, the Bible said God was furious. How can he that made heavens and the earth, how can such a thing be too much for him to do? Do you know that it's not too much for God to strengthen a limb that is crooked? It's not too much for God to make a new hand to grow to someone that have no hand. It's not too much for God to give a new brain cell to people who are suffering some brain damage of one kind or the other. It's not too much at all. You just lay hands and keep speaking the word and into, you know, concerning your situation and say, in the name of Jesus, let new cells come into this brain. Let new brain cells be created in this brain and let it begin to do what I couldn't do before. And it will happen. You never consider anything too much for God to do. I know of a student in a school. He was having limitation in brain. Uh, he, he suffered some brain damage. And he was supposed to be sent for special education. But there was no special people who can offer that special education. So they brought him to a Christian school. 
And I can remember the proprietress said, bring her. Bring her. We will be laying hands every morning and talking to the brain, new brain cells to be created in her. And, and it will happen. You know, the proprietors know about faith. You know that's what they did. Do you know that in, within months, that girl began to do what she could not do before? By the time the girl left the school, she was like every other normal student. And he did it every day. God said, when you speak to your mountain, it happens. It works. So as, as they were bra- laying hands on her, commanding new brain cells to be created, they were being created until she became like every other student. That can be your story. You don't need to limit God. Whatever is your situation, you, God can do it. God who created the galaxies can do it. God who created the heavens and the earth can do it. He says there's nothing too difficult for God. Let's not limit God. Then lastly, number three, thing I want to share from this scripture, how they limited God. You know, well, before I go to that number three, let me just tell you, the Bible says that the power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in you. If you're a Christian, that's a power that you carry. That power that raised Christ from the dead. I want you to know that the greatest power God ever initiated in history is the raising of Christ from the dead. It's far greater than the power that was used in creating the universe. And that is, the power is not great because someone had to come from the dead. No, many people were raised from the dead before. When Christ was raised from the dead, it wasn't an ordinary raising of someone from the dead. The Bible says in Adam, we all died. When Christ was raised from the dead, it was a complete reversal of all that death that came upon the entire creation in Adam. When Christ was raised from the dead, there was a complete reversal of that death that happened in Adam. So that's why the resurrection of Christ is, when you read the Paul's writing, you see that he uses many adjectives to qualify the power that God used in raising Christ from the dead. Because it was the application of power to reverse all the damage done by the sin of Adam to creation. And all lives that were ever born and will ever be born. Praise the Lord. And that power is at work in you. That's the power that is at work in you. Let me just share this number three quickly and then we go to prayer. Another reason, another way people limit God is by becoming double minded. In being double minded, they say one thing now. They can even say something in the presence of brethren. Ah, we know God will do it. We know. But when they now go to private, they say something else. When they are now discussing with another person, they say something else. And that, that is double-mindedness. That's what the children of Israel did too. In Psalm 78, let's read verse 36 and 37. The Bible says, in verse 36 and 37 of that Psalm 78, the Bible says, Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. You know, brethren, if there's a struggle, we can admit a struggle, but we must keep one narrative. We must reach a settled conviction about things and let our words reflect that conviction continuously because in james chapter 1 you know verse 8 the bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all verses 7 and 8 says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways he said let such a person not suppose that he will receive anything from god not because god will not give but he cannot receive Because you need steady faith to receive. Faith is the hand by which you receive from God. And if it is not steady, it cannot receive. So, double-mindedness limits the power of God in people's lives. 
limit their experience of the power of God. God has already given us all things in Christ Jesus. He's not withholding anything from us. The Bible says, He who gave us His Son while we were sinners, is it now that we are reconciled to Him that He will withhold good things from us? No. If He could give us His best, His Son, while we were yet sinners, then now that we are even reconciled to Him, this is not when He will withhold. He will not love us less now that we have become His children. If He loved us like that and gave us His Son, why we were sinners. He wouldn't love us less when we have become his children. The Bible says he would gladly with him give us all things. And that's what he has done. Peter said he has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Paul said he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So we need to be steadfast in our minds. We, in fact, in order to be steadfast in our minds, God gave us the mind of Christ. He gave us the mind of Christ. You need to be saying to yourself, I have the mind of Christ. Therefore, I can be consistent in faith. I will give no, no excuse that it is because of this, because of this, that is why I'm not able to be consistent and steadfast. He said, no, those things are not stronger than the mind of Christ that I possess. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. You already have it. You don't need to feel it. You have it. You just need to claim it and believe in it. Then it begins to function in you. You have the mind of Christ. Glory be to God. So no more double-mindedness. It limits our ability to experience God. That even though God gives us all things richly to enjoy, but we cannot experience Him. We cannot experience it. But today, God is calling you to remove all the barriers. Remove all the barriers. Stop limiting God. Remove all the barriers and experience God. God wants you to experience Him. God wants His good thoughts to be implemented in your life. So are you willing to fight against the limitations and remove them? That's what God wants to do tonight. Let's go to God in prayer. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory be to God.